I don't know how often you've had the chance to introduce somebody who's got their own Wikipedia page. It, it makes it much easier, doesn't it? Um, I just tell you, well, if you want to know anything about Ulrika, go and look on Wikipedia. Um, but it's a, it really is a wonderful honor to, to have her speak uh, with us today. Um, Ulrika, I have to put a little plug for topology. It's part of our topology session that she's here, of course. Uh, but her reputation and her contribution to mathematics is uh, consider considerably wider. Um, so at the moment, Ulrika is director of the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge, but she still keeps her foot at the University of Oxford, which is where she was before, um, before she took up the position, which is a five-year appointment. And uh, there are many accolades. In context, uh, she has a big footprint. She has a big footprint mathematically and the, the research that's going on still at Oxford in particular, the group that she started there. And if you look at her prizes, there are many, but we should perhaps uh, mention in particular, if you were here yesterday for, uh, for Neil's talk, he mentioned Emmy Noether. Um, uh, that's one of the, one of the l prizes on the list that um, Ulrika was the Emmy Noether lecturer for the German Mathematical Society uh, a few years back. So I'm not going to go through all the lists. She's a humble person, um, and she's here to, to share something about her insight into topology and uh, the shape of data. And as I said, Ulrika, it's a wonderful privilege to have you. So thank you so much for giving your time and for, for sharing your mathematics uh, with us today. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your kind words. It's absolutely a pleasure and privilege to be here and to be part of this celebration. And I think uh, you know, a celebration it really is, and uh, we should celebrate really uh, mathematics and uh, indeed this anniversary. So um, David just mentioned that I'm uh, also an IMU president, uh, vice president, sorry, and. Uh, I'd just like to share actually a message from the IMU. I just uh, had a email conversations with the president, uh, Hiraku Nikayama, and also the secretary, Christoph Sorgo, and uh, would like to um, send our great uh, congratulations to Ames here in South Africa, and uh, also Ames more uh, broadly uh, in Africa. I'd also like to just say a few words about you know, celebrating mathematics, we should be probably a little bit more proud of what we do and uh, what we contribute to society. I mean, Wigner, uh, the famous physicist, and I think uh, uh, Neil might have mentioned him already, uh, he once said, he talked about the um, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics when he received his Nobel Prize uh, about 60 years ago. And it's not just in physics where um, mathematics is just unreasonably effective. Uh, think about cryptography. Even the field that you know, Hardy, uh, a famous um, a number theorist uh, in England, he once wrote an apology for mathematicians, thinking, I'm such a pure mathematician, my work will never be used, but I still uh, like to defend myself. But actually his work in particular has been used, of course, in uh, say cryptography, and we use it every day. Each uh, a credit card transaction is actually using his um, uh, work in a way. Um, that's not something about mathematics that is so global, and I guess abstractness makes it so useful. Um, I just want to mention a more modern example, uh, a colleague of mine in uh, Oxford, he was sponsored by uh, Hoover, the vacuum uh, company, and did some analysis there, um, you know, how to uh, do filters most appropriately and effectively. And it turned out that the same technology later was used, actually, to filter uh, the groundwater in the Ganges uh, Delta area, um, filtering out arsenic. And, of course, that immediately affected hundreds of thousands of people uh, in one go and uh, probably uh, saved uh, thousands of lives as well. So um, I'm going to go f and talk a little bit later about data science. That's, of course, another area where as mathematicians, we have to put uh, our word in. 
Um, you know, it's data science is completely new science. Of course, it's based on statistics and all sorts of other um, scientists have to work and we have to work together with them. However, some of the crucial basic ideas we have to expect have to come from mathematics, really. Just think about how computer science was founded. You know, the basic ideas the people in, uh, who were really truly involved at the beginning were mathematicians. Um, one example is uh, Alan Turing, uh, you know, founder, uh, probably the, one of the first people to ever build a computer. So I think we, we have also our obli an obligation there uh, to do our best. So in that sense, I think at the same time as uh, we look back, how mathematics has been very helpful, I think we have to look forward and in England in particular, there's a much of a, um, a, I wouldn't say a hype, it's just a realization really. This is the area of mathematics and there's a, a report and that came out a, a few years ago called the era of mathematics, thinking that basically every scientific and also social sciences, they're all are now using, whether it's through data science or through other methods, mathematics and it's a foundational and you know rigorous way of thinking if you like uh, that is and the abstraction that comes that is absolutely foundational to all of that indeed uh, there was a report it's now a little bit uh, outdated well a little bit dated i should say outdated probably not it's probably only increased but uh, there was a report uh, by um, the um, consultancy from deloitte also based on uh, uk data but in uh, 2013, they realized, or they um, wrote this report and found that uh, the impact on the UK economy of mathematics is more as than 10%, that's the estimate. This is huge, right? Uh, so mathematics really being at the basic of the economic, but also the scientific uh, driving. And, you know, look at, um, um, China, um, and since I'm still on the IMU page here, <laughs> uh, the IMU has, you know, has two things it does, uh, I think that are really relevant maybe today. One is, and I come to it in a moment, uh, the um, uh, CDC, uh, which is a commission for a developing country. Uh, the other one is, you probably know it from the uh, most, uh, is the uh, ICM. Every four years, uh, there's a big congress. And in 2002, there was a congress in uh, China. And the then uh, president, Jiang Zemin, actually said, we are going to double the funding for mathematics. And I think that was a, a great investment. Just look where China is uh, uh, now, 20 years later. So um, I think there's a lot that we can uh, contribute uh, to society. And I think this institute in particular is uh, really geared to uh, do that. So um, let me just move on uh, now, uh, because I also want to give my own congratulations from the institute, from one institute to another. So uh, many congratulations uh, on the 20 year anniversary. And uh, my last uh, advertising slide is <laughs> uh, the, um, and there are a few new opportunities which we hope um, you help us to realize that um, we get the right, uh, a lot of people uh, to take uh, part and uh, advantage of these. One is the IMU Simons Research Fellowship Program. They're both brand new. <laughs> they have only been announced uh, uh, earlier this uh, month. Um, what, and, you know, both of them are effectively doing the same, um, bring scholars from developing countries uh, to help them to go anywhere they want. Uh, to spend uh, a month or three months uh, uh, being immersed in um, mathematics, having a sabbatical. And uh, of course, the INI, we run research uh, programs that are often half a year long, thematic, and uh, we'd love you to come and uh, spend some time with us uh, on a thematic theme that uh, is relevant uh, to you. So, <laughs> now <laughs> to my talk. Topological data analysis. Um, 
I sort of already gave a little bit uh, my motivation. Um, uh, yesterday, um, and Bruce Bartlett actually gave a, a beautiful talk in uh, the topology section uh, on uh, quantum topology. And that is actually where I started off. And my first 20 years or 30 years, uh, I've been working very much as a pure mathematician, uh, trying to understand uh, topological field theories from uh, a topologist's point of view. Um, but then there in England, there was the um, move to open a new data science institute, the Turing Institute. And uh, mathematicians really felt, well, we need to have a part of that. And indeed, uh, as part of this, you know, looking at the landscape, they were, uh, thought, well, we could build up capacity in topological data science. It was a relatively new field at the time. It's still somewhat um, you know, debated, is it useful, and so on. Uh, but I think that was uh, decided then in Oxford. We will uh, try to uh, build a group there. And as that's how I uh, got involved. And indeed, um, we now have a center for topological data uh, science. Uh, which I um, co-direct with my colleague, ha Heather Harrington. And the idea there is really to take it uh, to heart that we want to apply, okay? It's not just doing pure mathematics, not doing the abstract thing, but we want to uh, apply uh, the mathematics. And uh, she's very much on the applied side, and I'm more on the pure side. So it, uh, the idea was that uh, we would have a data-driven um, research program. So, in other words, it's theory, there's a topological data that comes from sort of algebraic topology, very much pure math, going into the uh, science, but then looking at the data and asking what are the problems there and how can we come back and maybe ask the theorists to do more theory to yeah, uh, improve our tools to go back. And this effectively is going to be my the plan of my talk. <laughs> so I will start uh, trying to explain what the data, uh, uh, topological data analysis is trying to catch and to do. Then I will try to give you some applications and then hope to come back um, to the theory. And we'll see whether we end up at the same point. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me start then uh, properly. So data. I say has shape. Now data is often just given uh, by a point cloud and uh, just some um, coordinates in some high dimensional space. And uh, certainly if you look at uh, the uh, configurations here, you immediately see though they're only just points, uh, you um, think we have four clusters in the first one, there's a Y formation, the middle one, and there's some sort of circle annulus on the uh, right hand side. And that's, we interpret it uh, immediately because it's nicely uh, presented to us on uh, just a page. But just imagine these points are given to you as coordinates in some high dimensional uh, uh, vector space. This would be very difficult to see. Okay? So, uh, topological data analysis is trying to uh, catch the, um, this sort of shape that I uh, um, just written down there. Now, of course, uh, the shape uh, in this uh, cluster of Y formation and uh, circle are not really depending on where exactly every point is. It's just roughly the uh, right area. And then you can see uh, the, oops, oops. Hmm. Right. The Y uh, formation, sorry, I have to be careful here. Point here, yeah, or the circle. Okay, so why is topology a good field to actually try to understand uh, data analysis uh, or data in general? Um, well, uh, I think of three good reasons. Um, some of you might recognize this is the Johannesburg Transportation Map. It's not a geographic map. Actually, I haven't checked, but I doubt that streets in Johannesburg are quite this straight and uh, uh, loops are quite uh, uh, nice like this. Right? This is a topological map. We make it easier for us to understand the um, uh, geography of the transport system and navigate it by simplifying, by making things straight. And the most important thing that we um, uh, keep is 
where do these um, uh, lines meet? Where can I get from one transportation um, method to another? Right? That's the connection points. That is the important bit. That we have a loop maybe here is the important bit. Um, so effectively by suppressing some of the uh, detailed data, we actually learn something. We understand something. Another thing is, um, you know, often uh, graph theory is uh, interesting. You know, you have two points and you have a relation between the input and edge in between them. However, sometimes you want to catch higher dimensional, more complicated relations. And as this is um, just to say here, you have a torus, and it's not just simply, um, you know, a graph relation. There's a hole inside this torus. And that is a two-dimensional phenomena that we would like to catch. Similar here, uh, Bruce actually had them, the same picture in his talk. They're the Burmian rings, right? Uh, any two rings, think uh, the third one uh, away, are not connected, are not linked. But the three of them are related. And so that's something that can, uh, topology can uh, again catch. And then the Final thing is, and that's of course important, if we want to do data analysis, we need to be able to compute. <laughs> uh, there's no point in actually having wonderful theory if we can't actually apply it. So, uh, we have computable signatures. So what's a signature? Sometimes also called invariant. And uh, this is actually something that goes back to Euler, hence its name, Euler characteristic. Euler decided, okay, here we have two first surfaces. One is just a um, ball, and the other one is uh, um, the surface of a donut. And I can divide up uh, the surface in uh, here four regions. Um, and I now can uh, calculate, I can count how many faces do I have? Four, and have two vertices here, and one, two, three, four edges. And I've forms this sum, namely the faces plus the corners minus the edges, and it gives me two. And I do the same for the donut. If I, again, uh, you know, every um, colored face is just a polyhedron, and um, I have, again, four here. Uh, but in this case, how many vertices do I have? Well, one, two, three, four. That's this four here. And then I have eight edges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the other characters in this case give me zero. And this is really quite um, uh, significant, uh, these uh, other characteristics, because they basically completely classify all the surfaces topologically. Now, um, what does that mean? Uh, well, first of all, these numbers are invariant signatures in the sense that if you give me another way of dividing up uh, these surfaces, I get the same number. So here's actually a whole slide on uh, doing this. Namely, you know, effectively every polyhedron, up topologically seen, is just a ball. Just go inside the polyhedron and punch out uh, all the uh, corners and make it all smooth, right? Then these are just balls. And I can uh, calculate, once again, the Euler characteristic number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces. And in each of these exercise, you just get two. So this is what we mean by it being an invariant. It doesn't matter how you divide up. It is always the same number. And it's characterizing our space. Now, numbers are good. They're easy to deal with. But they're also a bit rigid. You can't really see maps between them. Uh, they are very simple mathematical uh, objects. So um, what we need is a refinement. OK, so now I'm uh, going into the most technical part, effectively, of the talk. It's something uh, from uh, algebraic topology. It's a refinement of this uh, Euler characteristic that gives us a little bit more. And it's going to be important later on. Um, right, so how uh, do I get this in order to uh, get a calculable thing and something I can easily define? I'm just going to look at spaces as combinatorial things, okay? I build up, approximate any sort of space I might like to study by 
um, you know, putting points, edges, triangles, and tetrahedra, solid tetrahedra together, uh, like something like this, um, and approximate my space. And I shouldn't really stop at tetrahedra. they are higher and higher dimensional analogs of this. And so I can build up any sort of complicated object that you might want to study. Um, now, if I have such a space, given combinatorially like this, I can form what is the homology. It's a scary word, but it is just linear algebra, which is very simple. Namely, I take the vector space spanned by the vertices, F is the field. I take the vector span, uh, space spanned by the edges, and so on, a higher tetrahedra. And then I have maps between them. And the maps are just looking what, what is the boundary. You know, give me a tetrahedra, uh, and I just look, uh, so for example, if I have a solid triangle, the boundary of a solid triangle are the three edges that bound it. Okay? Um, and uh, this gives me, a, uh, induces a linear map uh, from one to the other vector space. And the key observation for homology is actually, uh, and it's actually something that comes out on, uh, on um, it's also used uh, of uh, interest in uh, PDEs and so on, but a key observation is that the boundary of a boundary is always empty. And so the consecutive application of these maps is always gonna be the zero map. I'll think about, once again, the triangle, triangle, the uh, boundary are the three edges. The three edges are basically like a circle and they don't, there's no boundary, right? So the boundary of a boundary is uh, uh, empty. Now, that is enough for us to now say we can form homology uh, uh, groups, namely, I take the kernel, the kernel of the one map will include the image of the privilege, uh, previous map, but that's what it means, uh, the composition of these two maps is zero. And the difference between these is measured by these homology groups. And uh, so-called Betti numbers are just giving me the dimension of this, which is just the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the image of the previous one. And I said it's a refinement of the Euler characteristic. It's an exercise in linear algebra. It can be done by a first year um, uh, undergraduate student effectively is just um, the Euler characteristic is actually just a way, uh, another way of calculating is uh, by taking the alternating sum of the Betty numbers. So it's a refinement because now we, instead of having numbers, only numbers and all in one, we have these vector spaces that we can look at. So here's an example. Um, I have, here's a triangle which is hollow. And that indeed shows up as Betty number one. Uh, altogether, this is uh, one connected component. I can go from any point to any other point, and that gives me Betty number one for um, B0. And then um, this is a solid tetrahedron, but this is a hollow tetrahedron. So we really have something, a two-dimensional whole and those are counted by the second Betty numbers. So really, um, this is just um, trying to explain what these Betty numbers are counting. So connected components for Betty zero, uh, loops uh, like this one triangle, uh, empty triangle for uh, Betty one, and uh, cavities for Betty two. Now, why do we gain something, or what do we gain by going to this um, you know, more complicated version of the Euler characteristic? The one important part is actually the functoriality. So just think of a subcomplex, you know, just take some of the triangles and edges, and that's a subcomplex. And if we uh, and then take the homology, the enzoomology of the subcomplex, there's a natural map into the enzoomology of uh, the whole complex, just because, uh, going back one step, you know, I, uh, the, for the subcomplex, there are just sub-vector spaces and the boundaries are uh, compatible. So we just get um, this um, map in homology. Now that's absolutely crucial in what I'm gonna say in a moment, okay? This functorality. Right, okay, now, um, 
homology goes back uh, nearly 20, uh, um, uh, 150 years to uh, Poincaré. He was thinking more in terms of Betty numbers, really. I think uh, real credit uh, is due to uh, Aminoto once again. Uh, she actually, I never thought actually of her as being contributing to uh, topology, but she was the one, as an algebraist, um, realizing that you should make use of the fact that you have vector spaces. You, every vector space is the same as another vector space of the same dimension, but you can have maps between vector spaces, and the maps are not all the same. And that's an important part, and she realized that there's a, huge, uh, there's a real power in that. Now, that is exactly what is effectively uh, giving us the main tool of topological data analysis, namely persistent homology. So, um, let me start again. How do we go from data, like the point clouds that I started off with, to something that is a, a topological space, right? Um, now, here is the easy thing to do. Here is my point cloud. It doesn't really have shape, but I make every point bigger. I just make them slightly larger. And suddenly, I see so certain shapes appearing and certain holes as well. And this is now something that has some intrinsic interest and something that I can study with topology. Now, this union of uh, balls uh, is a little bit harder to um, work with, so we want uh, our approximation, which is a simplicial complex. And, uh, well, there are two versions actually here. One is, uh, okay, well, they start off the same. Namely, we take a vertex for every point in the point cloud, and we get an edge for every uh, two points that are less than, say, um, delta, uh, epsilon apart, okay? And then, um, what about triangles? Well, there are two versions here. This version says, well, I get a triangle if all the three points are enclosed in a ball of ep uh, radius epsilon, or uh, actually epsilon and a half, the way I set it up, right? So they all have to be contained in a ball, and then I put in a tetra, solid tetrahedron, and they're all contained in a, a, another solid ball of that radius. Now, that's quite hard to compute, actually. Um, computer scientists will tell you it's not easy to write a program. It's a, it takes a lot of time to compute that. So instead, um, people are looking also at the so-called Viatoris Rips complex, where we just throw in an, uh, a triangle whenever for example, here's a very good example. Whenever we have the three sides, I throw in the triangle. Whenever I have the four sides of a tetrahedron, I throw in the tetrahedron, I fill it in, and so on. So this is an easier way to just build up the complex. It's a little bit different, right? Here, the three balls don't intersect, and we have an empty triangle. Here, um, we don't care about it. We have all the triangles, and we throw it in. Okay, luckily, <laughs> We are theoreticians, and we know about the theory, and we know actually um, some true theorems uh, that have been around for 50 years or so. Uh, namely, one is the so-called nerve theorem, which tells us that the point clouds, the union of all the balls, the homology of that, the shape of that, is really truly uh, reflected in the uh, check complex that I built up. And then the other one is that, well, the check complex includes into the RIPS complex, but however, certainly if we're working in a, a Euclidean space, that RIPS complex is included in a check complex of a slightly bigger radius. So we have this interleaving of the um, RIPS complex and the check complex, and the check complex reflects the topology that we see effectively. So theoretically, it's okay. We can just work with uh, the easy to compute RIPS complex. But in all of this, you know, who told me that this particular epsilon is a good one to look at? How, if I have abstract data, how do I know what epsilon to choose? The answer is we don't. So what's the solution? The solution is well, you consider all of them. 
Now, this sounds a little bit crazy, but actually, it is really quite a nice uh, thing to do. And we are now using exactly the idea that we have functoriality, right? The Rips complex for one epsilon will include into the Rips complex uh, for an epsilon that is bigger. And so we have not just the different groups, but we have them uh, connected by strings. So I'm going to just illustrate what persistent homology gives you in this very simple example. So we have the point clouds, we build up our Rips complex for the different epsilon, right? For uh, this epsilon, we put in only the edges between nearby points and so on. And we build it up, but of course, once our epsilon is too large, we just cover the whole thing and it's just a blob, right? There's not much to be seen. Okay, so what's happening here? Um, now we have the homology groups. In this case, we have uh, dimension zero and dimension one to account. Dimension zero, remember, this is a blue, counts how many different components we have. Here we have lots, so we start with lots and then they become less. And then here, we only have one component, and that persists to it at the end. In dimension one, we count sort of loops, enclosed loops. So it only starts, uh, there's a big one here which persists, and then it's gone here, so that corresponds to this. And there's some spurious ones that come up in the middle, which sort of are basically nearly error terms. So, this is how we now recognize that effectively, you might say this is data maybe taken from an analyst or a circle, namely we have one dimension persistent uh, homology in dimension zero and one persistent homology in dimension one, okay? That's how we try to think about it. Now, uh, I've written these bars and um, certainly in dimension zero you can always do that. But there is a bit of a theorem behind this that you can represent the persistent homology, you know, the continuation of this is coming from the maps between the complexes, um, that we can do this, and uh, indeed there are two meta theorems that I want to mention. One is that we can always find a good basis so that um, effectively we have a um, representation by these bars, and that's why we have to work actually over a field for those of you who are in algebra, uh, and, um, a polynomial ring over a field is a PID and has a nice decomposition theorem uh, modules, have a nice decomposition theorem. That's not true for if you work over Z. Um, so we have to work over a field. And then there's a stability theorem that just says, if I change my points just a little bit, maybe there's a little bit of, um, uh, you know, I do the experiment twice and there's slightly different readings, then I want to come to a similar result. And uh, the stability theorem tells us exactly that. You know, you start off with your problem, you do your measurements, you do it the second time, it should come to a similar thing. Right, now, um, that's persistent homology when we have one data set. But I already said, you know, we might want to have uh, repeat your experiment and um, want to compare your results. So you need some tool of comparing the end results. And uh, one um, buzzword here is a vectorization of our barcode. Um, in other words, when we have vectors, when we can think of our output as a vector, we can add, we can take averages, and we can do statistics on the results. So here is our barcode. Now that barcode appears just represented by these um, triangle hats, uh, which I can see, uh, think of uh, different functions. And some of you might have seen persistent uh, diagrams, and that's just this tilted by 45 degrees. Right? That's a good way of representing this, completely equivalent, of course. And then I can, um, uh, what I do is actually, well, I, I can look at the uh, top one. Uh, if I just uh, line out these top, uh, the, the blue line here, everything, uh, you know, underneath I have at least one bar. That's what it says. But then I also can look at this dashed one, the red one here, and underneath it, when I look at here, I will have at least two bars. And then finally, there's a little triangle when I have actually three of them overlapping. 
So it's just a complete uh, equivalent um, information here, only now these are functions, these are three functions, and functions I can add, I can take averages. And um, you know, uh, this is um, so-called uh, persistent landscapes, and uh, they um, behave well, they obey the law of large numbers, central limit theorem, etc. cetera, um, and this was uh, something invented by Bubenik. Okay, now this is only one vectorization method, but it's the one that I uh, like to think about. Um, another thing is, of course, if you want to do anything <laughs> and with uh, actual data, you need to have uh, computing, you need power, uh, and there are now many, many different um, programs doing slightly different things, uh, being, uh, um, you know, uh, working in different context. We once wrote a, you know, starting off really, and we wrote a survey article slightly to understand ourselves where we are, uh, and then uh, since then new packages have come, and maybe it's even time now to have a new benchmarking exercise as we did um, in uh, 2017. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about computing. Uh, that's uh, uh, something I'm just going to assume, uh, and a lot of people have worked on that. Let me come to applications. Now, I'm gonna mention three applications, not because they are so wonderful, mainly because I've been involved so I know about them. <laughs> but uh, I think the real point is that uh, each time you want to apply topological data analysis, you have to think a, a little bit about how you want to apply it. What is exactly the setup that you want to consider? Okay, so the first one is a sort of um, box standard uh, um, um, pipeline, uh, but let me first explain um, the data, and then we apply uh, the uh, methodology. Okay, so there's something called a, a protein bank. This protein bank has thousands of uh, images of proteins, and uh, they are uh, basically given as um, um, three-dimensional um, uh, coordinates where uh, we have amino acid chains and, um, and the, um, some of the proteins um, as a subset um, are so-called knotted proteins. There are much fewer of them, maybe about a thousand. Um, and a, a knotted protein is something that might look like this. So, of course, strictly speaking, not a knot, because uh, the ends are loose, uh, but you can see why we might call it a knot, and we can have a measure of how much of a, uh, uh, you know, how truly a knot it is by this knot depth, by trying to understand the length of the tails relative to the length of the red part here. So, um, and then within the knots, one can uh, concentrate um, on a particular type, namely the so-called trefoil knots, uh, which are the ones here, and uh, those are the, um, most of them, actually. Okay, so we wanted to understand within uh, the, uh, you know, looking at just at the uh, trefoil knots, how well are the different types um, separated by persistent homology. So, um, uh, what is our point cloud? Well, our point cloud, uh, just looking at the carbon uh, uh, points of the protein. Um, and these are just discrete points. They're sort of the red points in here. And uh, then these point clouds, we grow the balls around them and build our ribs complexes and we compute the persistent homology. And uh, the persistent homology either gives us a, a persistent diagram or actually what I said before, we have this landscape. The landscapes are just functions. I can uh, then uh, repeat the example on many others and uh, try to take averages. Now, the one thing that uh, is somewhat new actually, there's a program that actually lets you find uh, the cycle that uh, represents um, you know, um, here is a kink here, and it is a one cycle, and uh, this um, program, Irene, uh, actually let me find a cycle that represents this one little kink, and that's drawn here. So we can identify the cycles as well, um, and okay, so this is what one does with one protein. Now, we want to see whether different types can be separated, 
And indeed, they can. Um, we had, I mean, this is just one example. We have a knotted, this is a complicated name of this particular protein, and uh, it's overlaid with an unknotted one of roughly the same type. It's a, they're very, very, very close. However, there's a one difference, namely in the knotted one, we have this little kink, and we can see that actually in the protein and the overlay, and it's exactly the point where the two crossings uh, uh, differ, making one knotted and unknotted. So um, this is just a very simple example of uh, what can be done, um, and just to explain the pipeline. Now, uh, another example, where one had to think a little bit out of the box um, was an analysis of blood vessels in a tumor. Okay? So here you have a tumor, here are the blood vessels, and we mark some points on it. All right, in a tumor, what do you expect? Well, the blood vessels are not um, grown so straight. There might be tortoise that might even have uh, cycles. The blood might circulate in itself rather than just have veins and arteries, one way system. And uh, so, then uh, in order to catch that, uh, what we did is uh, we uh, just take a point in the middle and grow a ball from that and just look at the blood vessel system that's intersecting with this ball. So, here is a bit more, and you would just grow that uh, ball. And then just look at H0 and H1, and uh, sorry, H0 <laughs> and H1. And indeed, again, with statistical analysis, you can see a difference between you know, uh, healthy tissue and tumor. Uh, and so that helps uh, one understand, uh, 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 you know, in principle, can be used in medical analysis. So the, the, the point I wanted to make here is that in, uh, it's a, sort of a different way of finding a filtration of our whole system, okay? That's what's happening here. Namely, uh, we build our whole blood vessels by just intersecting it with bigger and bigger balls. All right. Now, my final uh, example, also from uh, medical data, um, is a study of immune cells in tumors. Now, this is a very busy <laughs> slide. I probably want to explain all of the details in the interest of time. However, um, let me just very uh, quickly say, and this was, uh, uh, my collaborators were very excited, uh, and some uh, were actually medics. Um, they had this uh, wonderful uh, head, neck tumor data and they studied three different um, immune cells, so-called uh, T cells, the uh, CD8 and the FOXP3, and another one uh, which is called the macrophage, uh, CD68. Okay, so uh, the data was g g gave, um, that we had were giving us these uh, sort of point clouds and um, you, know, you could try to straight away apply uh, your standard methodology, grow balls around the points, and try to understand the homology. But if you look at these point clouds, it's quite uh, tricky. And somehow, you feel there's a big hole here that you should be detecting. However, these points in the middle are really messing up our analysis, because you also grow balls around those, and suddenly things are filled in very quickly. Similar here, you know, these uh, points are going to mess up. So the idea then is, well, you see, these are very isolated points. So if we could just say, well, we only want to consider those points, uh, work with those points which are, have a certain density around them, right? Then we can ignore the, uh, the ones that are messing up our uh, analysis. Okay, and that works. Um, you know, just ignore the ones that are sort of singletons and uh, work with the rest. And then you uh, see the shapes uh, very clearly. But just as before, when we grew the radius, right? Remember, we had this you know, beautiful picture with uh, balls of a specific radius. The question was, what radius did you pick? So similarly here, what density do you pick? Uh, um, uh, pick? 
So density function is generally something like, uh, oh, I, I see at least uh, two or three peop uh, th other points in a certain neighborhood, right? So, so density, once again, we can't choose a priori, and we have to take all of them. And so we get a two-dimensional picture, a multivariate picture. And these are just heat um, maps. Uh, so uh, before, as before, the radius goes in this direction and the core density goes in this direction. So when um, we sort of pick um, very few points, uh, of course, we're not going to see much of a homology. And similar, if we uh, pick all points, then there's not much homology there either. However, if we pick the right sort of density, then at a certain radius, we see all these uh, big holes, and uh, the heat map tells us this exactly. Okay? And that gets different patterns coming from the different tumors. So now with this sort of two-dimensional analysis, two-dimensional version of what we had before, we now can actually uh, separate the different um, um, immune cells. So this is a PCA a principle component analysis, not the greatest separation, however, the uh, linear discriminant analysis here does quite well in separating these uh, different um, immune cells. And uh, here's a simple curve. Uh, we just take the integral around, uh, along the um, density, and then that gives us this, these curves. And again, you sort of see that the, um, uh, we have a reasonable separation between them. Okay. Now, I've given these applications. Um, back to theory. <laughs> okay. Um, this is, the idea is, you know, you go into application, you try to understand your problem there, you run into problems, <laughs> and you need to have probably more tools, or you do something which is heuristically uh, uh, okay and works, but you want to, uh, to understand why it works and prove that it works. So, um, right, there are many theoretical questions that uh, um, uh, come up. Uh, I just, oops, <laughs> what happened there? Uh, I don't think I can, ah, there we are, yeah. Okay, so there are many different ways um, of, um, yeah, many different questions, theoretical questions. One is a multi-parameter question. Um, we had these beautiful bar, um, barcodes, and the barcodes told us everything about the homology, and uh, what about in higher dimension? These pictures are not so easy, they're actually not completely um, you know, uh, defining the uh, multi-persistence. That's one big question and has been a big question and still is a big research um, area. And I will say a little bit more in a moment. Another one is, um, you know, you have a point cloud, some random point cloud, you get it, you analyze it, and you get some homology, okay? There's a study, for example, of uh, the brain uh, nerve, uh, sorry, um, synopsis in your brain, uh, and they made that into a simplicial complex, did some analysis, and they found some homology, I forgot exactly the number, but in, in dimension, something like 100 or something, 100 and something, yeah? What does that mean? <laughs> Is this what we should expect? Um, you know, how can we interpret it? So there is actually uh, something uh, called uh, random topology, which has become more and more important, actually, for, uh, in the context of uh, topological data analysis, where you study a point cloud and you just ask yourself, what is the expectation that I should see homology? This is actually something that has been studied for graphs uh, quite a bit already. Random graph uh, is uh, uh, well known. You know, when do you expect, for example, uh, uh, to see uh, graphs to be connected? Uh, when do you expect them uh, to have uh, many components uh, and so on? Okay, so that's uh, one area uh, which I have done some work. Um, another one is uh, you want to combine right, uh, TDA, uh, data analysis. Uh, TDA tends to deal with uh, complex data more than big data. However, 
you might want to do something like machine learning, right? Uh, in order, you want to combine all the tools that uh, uh, theorists have. Um, now, machine learning is something that is sort of, in, well, it's a bit like Newton's uh, um, method, right? You always go uh, looking at the derivative and you follow the derivative in order to get to your optimi uh, optimal solution, hopefully, if it works out, right? But you need some sort of differentiability. And that's a big question, in what sense is persistent homology actually differentiable? So we did some study of that, and you know, uh, depending on the setup, it is actually differentiable, and you can use machine learning in uh, certain circumstances. The other thing is, yeah, you have a point cloud. <laughs> How much does persistent homology actually remember of that particular point cloud? What's the information loss? Yeah? How much do you throw away? Somehow you want to throw up, uh, away probably quite a bit, but how much do you throw away? Again, that's a big question, and, um, and people have been studying that as well. Okay, so the last um, few minutes, I just want to uh, home in on the multi-parameter uh, persistent homology. And you might be surprised, I'm not coming back to topology. <laughs> I'm actually coming back to algebraic geometry. And this is a beautiful thing that uh, I guess uh, I should have long learned from the um, th um, theoretical and uh, physicists or mathematical um, physicists. Namely, you just throw at your problem whatever tool you have. <laughs> You're not sticking to a particular mathematical problem, um, a pr um, subject area. Um, so, uh, and this is actually what is happening here as well. Um, so this is quite um, a recent uh, study. Um, now, let me just go one step back and explain a little bit more why multi-parameter persistence is a, um, has theoretical, um, throws up theoretical questions. Um, now, um, what we had before, you know, uh, not only the radius, but we also sort of have a density measure, and the density here is, um, indicated by the depths of the green of these points. And so, um, you know, while persistent uh, homology is really an example of a persistent module, but a persistent module is really a module over, as I said before, over the polynomial rings with one variable. And this one variable just tells me how I go from um, uh, one radius size to the next radius size. That's what the action of X will be on my module. And so it's really a persistent module is just a functor from um, you know, the integers ordered with the ordered, I'm thinking of it as an ordered set, into the category of vector spaces. Some of you, I think, like category theory. So that's what it is, right? It's just a functor from a partially ordered set, uh, from an ordered set to um, the category of vector spaces. Algebraic geometers might think of it as a representation of a quiver um, for some a n quiver for some n. I'd say a quiver is really just a graph with directed edges. That's all. Okay. So now, if we go to multi-parameter, in that sense, multi-parameter persistent homology is just a quiver on a lattice, namely you have um, you know, all your points um, Kn in, in the two-parameter two case, and then you have um, a maps between, uh, directed maps between them uh, from following the order of uh, the two-dimensional um, Z to the Z, cross Z. Now, Gabriel Zisman has a classification, and so this goes back in the 60s, I think, um, there's a classification theorem of these um, quiver representations, and um, though there's beautiful theory, complete theory for these AN quivers, it completely fails when we go to other quivers, and there can be um, um, even tree graphs and so on. So, uh, and there can't be complete invariance. So the, the search is really on to find good invariance. They can't be complete, meaning they can't completely distinguish between all the different uh, um, multi-parameter persistence modules, but we want to find good ones, okay. Right, so in the search of such a 
multivariable persistence, we moved, uh, we looked at um, the harder Narashima filtrations of persistence model. So this is something that goes back also to the 60s, 70s, um, was done first for vector uh, uh, bundles on Riemann surfaces. Uh, but it's actually giving us a beautiful theory that we can uh, now study multivariable persistence homology. Very briefly, a quiver, as I said, is just a graph with vertices Q0 and directed edges, Q1. And the, um, I can uh, form a category of finite dimensional representation. So that means just to every vertex, I associate a vector space. And to, for every edge, which is a directed edge, I associate a linear map. That's all, OK? Vertexes give, have uh, vector spaces associated and edges linear maps. And then for any sort of weight function, I can define an alpha slope, which is just um, the dimension, uh, the total dimension of all these different uh, vector spaces, um, weighted by um, this function alpha. So it takes the sum of all uh, vertices, weighted, weights the dimension by alpha of x, and then divide by the total. That's called a slope. And we say uh, a vector space is semi-stable with respect to alpha if for every sub-representation, so any um, sub -vectors, collection of sub-vector spaces that uh, are connected by these linear maps, then the slope of the bigger one is greater than the slope of the smaller one. That's not a difficult definition. Uh, slightly strange looking and uh, I think uh, I will have to leave it at this, <laughs> at that uh, uh, for today. However, uh, there is a, a very strong theorem, namely with this uh, notation, uh, there is a so-called harder Narashiman filtration, namely for every non-zero vector representation, there's a unique way of filtering v, uh, v such that the successive quotients are semi-stable and satisfies a strong uh, inequality. So, because it's unique, um, that means for every alpha we think of, we have something which is an invariant, namely this tuple, uh, which just assigns uh, dimensions of these successive quotients in this unique way of uh, um, filtering uh, V, which is our multi-persistent uh, um, um, uh, module. So, um, this gives us a huge wealth of a potentially interesting invariants. And let me just finish by the next slide, namely, if I just take alpha, remember alpha is just a function on the vertices. I just take the most simple one, namely the delta function. At x, it tells me it's one, and otherwise it's zero. <laughs> so the slope is just taking the um, uh, dimension of the vector space at x relative to uh, the sum of all the uh, dimensions uh, at every other vertex. And then if I take the collection of these um, corresponding uh, invariants, call it a uh, skyscraper invariant, it is stronger than the one big, you know, the first invariant that was thought of by um, um, uh, Carlson and Morodian, namely the so-called um, rank invariant. Now, the rank invariant literally just says, okay, I'm starting at X and I'm going to go to Y. What is the rank of the image of my module going anyway from X to Y? And um, the, um, so this is uh, giving us a minimal strength of the simplest invariant you might possibly think of in this context. And uh, the other important thing, remember, we had sort of two meta theorems. One was the barcodes are actually giving you, uh, there's always a barcode, right? And the other one was uh, stability of uh, persistent homology, which is essentially just saying some continuity property. And indeed, the sky caper invariant is stable. It is continuous in that sense as well. So this is just kind of trying to make the loop back to rather pure mathematics. Um, uh, but possibly ending up uh, at a different space, uh, 
yeah, different um, set of tools than we started off with. But um, there we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrike. Um, we've got time for some questions. Uh, if you want to interrogate, understand more deeply, um, please put your hand up. And I encourage the students, don't, uh, don't feel because you're a student you have to be quiet. Uh, there's some roving mics as well. So put your hand up if you've got a question to ask. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. For me, it was enlightening. Um, I have a few questions. When I saw um, a slide that has that Bubenik's uh, paper on, yeah. uh, the slide, I saw JMLR's Journal of Machine Learning Research, and suddenly my heart, <laughs> my heart rate doubled because uh, I do AI and machine learning, and then David behind you is doing topology. Um, and I was wondering, um, you also mentioned that... Um, in one of your slides, one of the key questions is about the differentiability for things that, uh, like I understand, it's not really always differentiable. Um, what would your advice be to a center that has a research track in topology and topological data analysis and the research track in machine learning and AI? Um, what would the three big questions be that you would hope a center with this combination would uh, try to address, if you have any wish lists? Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's a question. I mean, you have to build on your strengths. So uh, whatever your strength is, I think machine learning seems to be one of them. I think combining machine learning and TDA has still huge potential and hasn't really been um, explored enough. And indeed, um, you know, there is sort of a continuation of effectively of uh, the center, which is now looking and trying to do that. But don't be scared. I'm sure you can find a, a, a good way to do that as well. I mean, there are so many uh, possibilities of how to do that, I think. And that is uh, a really important part. So, um, you know, much... Uh, uh, Machine learning, you look at the loss function, you like to minimize the loss function. The loss function uh, is depending on your persistent homology and you uh, try to go right at the derivative. Now, there are problems with that because uh, the differentiability is not uh, sort of global. You have to be careful not to end up in, in certain uh, sub um, spaces, substrata, uh, where you can't get out again. Or maybe that is okay. Maybe you want to use that. I don't know. So there's, there are uh, different possibilities there, uh, certainly. Um, this, I mean, our methodology, our theorem sort of has, has already been uh, used by some of the students to um, try to understand, have a classification of uh, certain graphs. Um, making use of um, um, yeah, um, persistent homology and uh, trying to um, employ machine learning. Now, they did maybe not hugely better than some other methodologies, but they certainly came close, and that was the sort of the simplest thing and the first thing to, to come to mind. So there are probably loads of uh, application area. And the other thing is, I, I think Gillian uh, did a wonderful job this morning in uh, showing also some other real uh, applications, and it's the data that might be of interest maybe here in uh, South Africa. Um, I mean, Gillian looked at um, um, data she got from uh, New Mexico, it was, right? Um, sorry? Mo Mexico? Mexico. Arizona. Arizona, okay, uh, close. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and just looking at uh, how certain um, you know, ground fields had uh, bumps, which were man-made, uh, and uh, you know, just detecting it from uh, air um, photographs, I believe. Um, or and the other uh, um, project she mentioned was uh, looking at uh, lakes effectively in uh, um, the Antarctic. Was it Antarctic? Yes. 
Arctic, okay, I kept it wrong <laughs> again. Uh, so, you know, those things are, you know, if you have data, then the question is, what can you do with the data and how can you use the methodologies most effectively? And there's it's just so many creativity and I think anybody who has, uh, you know, who is inventive and creative can have a huge contribution here. Okay, um, Bruce, I think I saw your hand first. Have you got the microphone already? Okay. Okay, then you've got the power. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that cool stuff at the end with quivers and all that, has that been applied to some? I mean, does it actually make a... Can you actually do that in practice um, for some data? Uh, good question. Yeah. <laughs> and always, uh, you know, it's brand new effectively. Uh, we ha know how to, um, sorry, the students have written actually a program, how to do it. What we haven't done yet is apply to real data. And I think you're right, whether it is actually a practical improvement is still to be shown. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so interesting topic. Uh, I'm interested in uh, application. Um, one interesting application would be um, uh, autonomous driving, using LiDAR uh, as a sensor, and uh, then we have uh, um, Pound Cloud. And could you give a comment about this application in this area? Because uh, one challenge is the computation time. I'm sure you can apply it, all right? I mean, whenever, <laughs> whenever there is topology, so, or when we say topology, it's nearly geometry that we're talking about, right? We are always talking about distances. Distances is less than geometry, but uh, uh, it's not purely topological either. So whenever there are distances that are of importance, uh, the topology of your way, um, then I think uh, one should expect that these methodologies can help. I, I can't point you uh, at the moment to uh, studies that have um, used it in this context, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there are, and maybe you have looked yourself already, but uh, I would not be surprised at all. Okay. Um, maybe um, could you give a little information about uh, the computation time in your case studies? Sorry? Uh, but uh, in your uh, applications, the computation time? Now you're talking, uh, do I know of computation time? So the computation time was a, a very important thing we looked at when we did our benchmarking exercise, the survey paper, and uh, indeed, uh, you know, listing very precisely this many nodes, how much computing time, how much uh, space time, etc. I can't give you the data at the moment for uh, the p specific applications here. Okay. I'm not even sure we caught that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I have questions for this stacked slide with the, with the cells, with the CD, CD8 and the oh, persistence oh, okay. diagram, um, where you had bi-persistence. Do you mean the, the third application? Yes, the cancer. This one. one, yes. So it's one slide, but I have at least two questions. So the first question is that the input data, you, you have drawn some point clouds in R2. Is this because it's data from microscope, microscope, a microscope or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, they're basically a sort of a one cellar, very thin layers cut through uh, neck um, and had a neck tumors and uh, this is data extracted from these photographs uh, so mm -hmm. you have to get this point cloud uh, from there. Yes and the next question is the persistence images so now you have two dimensions you have radius and density yeah and how are we supposed to read this is it yeah is it the dimension of the vector space at each point or what is it that you are drawing here? Uh, it's a bit 
uh, yeah, so if you fix, um, maybe that's the easiest, uh, if you fix a, a particular uh, density, right, then um, this is a heat map, and uh, it t tells you the height of the peaks. So in, in, indeed, these, I think, are all pictures of uh, lambda 1. Okay, so the different uh, the different landscapes, right? There was a lambda one, lambda two, etc., and they give you all uh, sort of a zigzag uh, diagrams under which you expect the bars to have w at least one, or at least two, or at least three um, dimensions. Yeah, and uh, so the uh, the yellow means the peak is very high, <laughs> and the red is less high, and the blue is yet less high, and the black is non-existing. Okay, so you do persistent landscapes in a horizontal direction, or is it bi-directional? It's bi-directional, right? I mean, the, uh, um, okay, so you have to, there are actually different choices that you have to pick uh, uh, for the persistent uh, uh, landscape. Um, so you have to sort of uh, look at each square and uh, understand the height in each square and, uh, and it is not, not just lines next to each other, it's actually trying to see the persistence also through uh, the other direction, yeah. Okay, I think I'll look it up. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit <laughs> more technical, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. There was a question at the back, yes? Yeah, uh, thank you for the beautiful talk. So I'm also interested in the cancer uh, immune uh, field actually, so, and I'm running a group uh, developing mathematical models in this field. Um, and we also get uh, multiplex histology uh, data yeah, of, of that kind and do some uh, analysis. But the real challenge is uh, for us to uh, bridge the mathematical models uh, with that uh, multidimensional data. So I'm uh, wondering, uh, yeah, how do you think of this? Can these methods be, be used um, you know, directly in the context of mathematical uh, modeling or model annotation, let's say to, can, can, can for example, can we combine PDE with PDE models and directly uh, derive the persistent homology and compare this to data statistically or something like that? Um, Are there any um, approaches? Examples um, like that? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, if, I don't know offhand an example, I, maybe somebody else and uh, lots of people in the audience. Uh, yeah, you know, example, Jillian is nodding. Oh. <laughs> I'm happy to talk to you later. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, whenever there is a modeling question which also includes some geometric interest, then I would expect it. But even if it isn't, if it is just outputting some data, right, then you're creating data which itself can then be analyzed. And maybe that data has shape. And maybe that shape has meaning, right? I mean, it's a question whether it's a, so, sort of a random thing that you expect to happen or whether it's actually something you can catch and that is reflected back in your modeling. So it's very much depending on, of course, exactly your setup. Um, but uh, there's always a, uh, a good discussion to be had. But Gillian knows of specific examples that might be of interest. Zero. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again for a beautiful talk. Uh, I would like to take you back to the beginning of your talk when you uh, spoke of the importance of mathematics. Uh, and it's indeed fascinating, this new application of very abstract mathematics that has come uh, through uh, topological data analysis. Could you maybe tell us a bit of a story of how it was born? Whether uh, it was an accident that this uh, link was discovered or whether it was an intention to, to find applications for this specific topic, and maybe make a comment in general on, on how do we go about finding new applications of, of very theoretical mathematics that we have currently? Um, good questions. Um, so the, the real origin of persistent homology is slightly, um, can I say, debated. Um, Indeed, it turns out that pure mathematicians have thought about uh, persistent homology as well, um, possibly in the early 90s already, uh, especially uh, people who are interested in symplectic 
cohomology. And indeed, uh, they have now imported back some of the advances of um, persistent homology. I mean, it wasn't known as persistent homology, but uh, symplectic um, top, um, topologist geometrists are now interested again in persistent homology and the theorem it's on uh, the way of thinking about it and have um, transported it back um, to, you know, if you like, pure mathematics, uh, which I think is an, quite an interesting development in itself. The origin sort of, of topological data analysis per se, I think I'm, uh, you know, in particular, Edelsbrunner was very interested in uh, that. Um, what were they interested in? I think, um, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a big school of uh, discrete and uh, geometric uh, computational mathematicians and uh, you know, people who actually use geometry also in computing. Uh, um, I think that's where his main interest came from. Um, and then um, you know, people like um, Gunnar Carlsen and uh, various other people joined. And uh, I think it, it became um, a, a stronger theory because the, uh, the more pure mathematics got mixed with the more applied orientation. Uh, and um, yeah, the, I think the real first application of data probably came, to data, uh, probably came actually only a little bit later because uh, you need a good computer program to compute persistent homology and then, you know, otherwise uh, you're a bit stuck. It, you can make theories and theorems. Uh, and that actually, I think, was, uh, um, I think Gunnar Carlsen had a big input in that because one of the uh, first algorithms um, uh, came through his work. And indeed, he, uh, in addition to being a topology, is also very much an algebraist. And this idea of uh, um, you know, um, PIDs having a beautiful um, uh, decomposition and uh, how to calculate those uh, decomposition effectively came in. Any other questions? Am I allowed to ask a question? <laughs> uh, whenever, well, many times when I hear uh, people giving talks on TDA, there's an element of, I don't know if it's humility or insecurity, um, where you, you say, we, we're not sure yet if it's useful, almost. Um, there's an aspect of that. Is that because you just don't want to be too evangelistic for what you're doing, or are there problems that you foresee, uh, or yeah, potential difficulties ahead? Um, good question. Uh, again, I, I think we are becoming a little bit more boisterous about this. <laughs> um, I mean, partially I think it, uh, there was a hesitation because uh, computing time was uh, difficult. Uh, higher homology is difficult to compute and costly effectively, um, roughly um, cubic in the input uh, data. Um, because, you know, matrix uh, multiplication is uh, tricky. Um, However, I think uh, the methodologies uh, that have been created and also the computer programs that have been uh, written and uh, ways of getting around uh, these sort of problems have become very, very strong so that we do now have a lot of applications. And I think, um, I, I still think actually it's not, um, not an excuse, it's just an maybe a fact at the moment that uh, we shouldn't look at big data, which, which was maybe the big thing uh, 10 years ago, everybody wanted to do big data. Um, a lot of data is just complex and intricate, and you need to understand that just as much as you want to understand big data and you want to automatize it, right? I mean, looking at these pictures, uh, a trained clinician can probably also distinguish between these different immune cells. However, how much time of a trained uh, technician do you want to use on looking at pictures like that? And rather, maybe just apply something that is uh, at least helping them to um, uh, make an initial guess. And this is, I think, where the strengths of uh, TDA might really uh, lie. All right. You've used up your chance to ask questions. So all that's left is to say thank you again, Ulrika, for your wonderful talk.